Okay, so what I want to do today is I want to continue the review of material we've done in hopefully an entertaining manner. And I want to again lead into possible projects. So if you're looking to do small with me this summer, here are some things you could look at. This will be also a great way to review for the almost the final for the third midterm. Okay, so it's another way to just see the material we've been doing all semester and see how it all connects together. If there are other topics you want to see, let me know. So far, the only email I've gotten has been on uh, cryptography, and I've just sent a private email about how to do applications there. Okay, so this is a version of a talk I've given several times last year. There's really only one place where the slides need to be updated, and I will let you figure out where it is. Okay. Uh, the last thing is there will be a randomized raffle on Friday for the person with the most class participation will receive a book prize. For those of you who have not been sending me emails about your comments, you have one last chance to email me. I will be weighing how many times your name is entered into the lottery based on how many comments you've been making throughout the semester. <laughs> right? And if this works really well, I will talk to Helsing at Williams to try to figure out how to fix the Helsing lotteries <laughs> with all the stuff that's happening. Okay, so introduction. So I want to explain Zeckendorf's theorem and a lot of the consequences of this. Some of you, if you've heard this talk before, I do apologize, it will be very, very similar. So I want to explain the consequences of a combinatorial perspective. And we spent a lot of time at the beginning of the semester talking about combinatorics and your know, good ways of counting things. I want to explain how it's not enough to have a proof of a result. Sometimes, some proofs are better than others. Depending on what you're trying to understand, what you're trying to see, Different proofs highlight certain features better than others. Uh, we're going to see generating functions. We're going to see partial fraction decompositions. I want you to get a sense of how these things are actually used to solve problems that if you don't care about, at least I care about. <laughs> and finally, I want to talk a little bit about some of the open problems and ask what you think the answer is for something. Uh, right now, my colleagues and I are not quite sure. Uh, anybody see the hidden pattern? Eves. Eves, very good. Email me. <laughs> Great, got it just before Friday. Okay. So, prerequisites, probability review. This should be very standard by now. If we have a random variable with a density, the density is non negative, it integrates to 1. The probability we take on a value between A and B is just the area under the curve from A to B. The mean is the average value, the variance is how much things are fluctuating. And then finally, the Gaussian is you know, one of the most important probability distributions. It's you know, given by the following. Why do we see the Gaussian so many times? Yes? Because the sum of independent random variables approaches the Gaussian. Good. The sum of nice independent random variables converges to a Gaussian. And that's one of the reasons why we'll see the Gaussian in so many places. So the other things we need from combinatorics and factorial, at least when n is an integer, a positive integer, is the number of ways to order n people when order matters, the binomial coefficients, you know, n choose k, is the number of ways to choose k people from n when order doesn't matter. And then the last is Stirling's formula. n factorial is about n to the n e to the minus n square root of 2 pi n. So we've seen lots of ways to get close to that formula. Uh, the best I think we did was the integral test from calculus, which gave us that the answer was somewhere between n to the n e to the minus n and n to the n e to the minus n times n. And in fact, the geometric mean of 1 and n is square root of n. So this is very reasonable. Okay, everybody should have seen the Fibonacci numbers, if for no other reason that we've done them this course. <laughs> okay, so I'm defining the Fibonacci's as fn plus 1 is fn plus fn minus 1. But I'm going to do something a little bit non-standard. What's the non-standard thing for the people who recognize the Fibonacci's? Yes. Starting with 1, 2. And I'm starting with 1, 2. I'm not starting 0, 1, 1, 2. Okay, so if you try to use this to email me anonymously about complaints about the course, it won't reach me. Today, I have to start the Fibonacci numbers 1, 2, 3, 5. And the reason is Zeckendorf's theorem. So Zeckendorf's theorem says that every positive integer can be written uniquely as a sum of non-adjacent Fibonacci numbers. So for example, and this is the one point in the talk where I should have updated things, but I'm lazy, 2012 should have, would have the following <laughs> decomposition. It's not that hard to update. All I would have to do is add an extra 1 over well, 1 plus 1 is 2, that's a Fibonacci number, 2 plus 3 is 5, 5 and 34 are not adjacent. So it's not that hard to fix this. You can now see why I have to define the Fibonacci's this way. If I start off with 0, clearly I'm not going to have uniqueness. 
If I have two ones, I'm not going to have uniqueness. So I have to stop like this to have a unique decomposition. I'm going to give you the simple proof that can be done just by waving your hands. All right, here's a proof of Zeckendorf. Take a positive integer. Subtract the largest Fibonacci number you can, and look at what's left over. Subtract the largest Fibonacci number you can from that. If those two numbers were adjacent, you could have subtracted their sum. And their sum is a Fibonacci number. And that violates the maximality of the number you subtracted. So again, I can just pull out my largest Fibonacci number less than my number. So the largest Fibonacci number less than 2012 is 1597. If I could have put off the next one as well, I could have pulled off their sum. So this proves that every number has a decomposition. It doesn't prove uniqueness. So if you want, if you get bored during this talk or later in the day, try to prove that if you have two different decompositions that are non-adjacent, then they have to be the same, if they're the same number. So two different decompositions? Of the same number. Okay. One of the nice applications of Zeckendorf's theorem is to convert kilometers to miles. Okay, I learned this from Carl Pomerantz. How many kilometers are there in a mile? 1.6. The golden mean is about 1.6. So essentially, if you write a number in second of decomposition, if you multiply every number by the golden mean, you basically inflated it by about 1.6, you've moved to the next second of, you've moved to the next Fibonacci number. So if you want to convert from miles to kilometers, take your second of decomposition, increase all the indices by one and out. If you want to convert from kilometers to miles, take your second of decomposition, decrease all the indices by one. The further you're driving, the more accurate this trick is. Okay, in this era of your know, modern cell phones and whatnot, it's really not as important to convert from <laughs> kilometers to miles quickly in your head. Uh, you might ask, is it really better to do a second of decomposition than <laughs> just multiply by 1.6? But it is a nice, curious fact. All right. As a Bostonian, I will not say this person's name. I need a volunteer. Lekkerker? Not even close. Lekkerker. It's know. Dutch. I would actually just be like a... Like a... Like a... Like a... Like a... So he Lekker. answered a very interesting question. So we have Zeckendorf's theorem. The next question you can ask is, well, how many summons do I need? And one of the things I want you to get a sense of is, you want to ask good questions. So when I ask a question, how many summons do I need? Well, the bigger my number is, the more summons I'm expecting to need. So I want to localize the window I study. So I'm going to look at all numbers between the nth and n plus the first Fibonacci number. These should have basically the same candidate set for summons in their decomposition. So I want to always compare apples and apples. This is very similar to when we do random variables. All random variables are real valued. We want to be able to add them. This is very similar to standardizing random variables. We want to be able to just look at just one table of the standard normal. If I want to look at sums of random variables, I standardize it to have mean zero, variance one, and look at what happens to that sum. So over here, if I want to compare how many summons do two different numbers have in their decompositions, those numbers should be about the same size. What does about the same size mean? That means it's about in the same interval, between the nth and n plus first Fibonacci number. And so what Lecky showed is that the number of summons is approximately n over phi squared plus one, or about 0.276n, where phi is the golden mean. The golden mean is going to occur throughout today's lecture. Remember, in the Fibonacci numbers, the golden mean comes in Binet's formula. It comes in writing down how you go in the limit between adjacent Fibonacci numbers. It's not surprising it's going to occur in so many places. All right. So here is a somewhat new result. Stuff like this had been done before, but my students and I took it into a little bit new avenues. So the next question you can ask is, as I vary my number m, between the nth and n plus first Fibonacci number, how does the number of summons vary? And so here is a plot of how the number of summons varies. It's a very good fit to a Gaussian. And in fact, we're able to prove it's a Gaussian, and I'm going to give you a couple of proofs, not just that this is a Gaussian, but in a lot of other situations, it's Gaussians as well. So the question is, is this a random variable or not? Well, you give me an integer, and I can calculate how many summons it does, and so I have a mapping from integers to the number of terms in the second row of decomposition. If I live between the nth and n plus first Fibonacci number, I can put a probability distribution on each integer being chosen. You know, the probability I choose the number is just going to be 1 over the total number possible. How many numbers are there between the nth and n plus first Fibonacci number? It's fn plus 1 minus fn, which by the Fibonacci relationship is just fn minus 1. And so I can study questions like this. 
Uh, the new thing that my students and I started to study, and this is a benefit of being a physics major as well, is you know, some of the other questions I'm interested in, is weightings between events. So we talked early in the semester about weighting lines at banks, and why banks now have one line feeding into four. You know, airplanes, airports do this as well. Airplanes, unfortunately, have one line coming in. Uh, what we can do is we can look at spacings between summons. How long do you have to wait before something interesting happens? And there are two ways you can do it. One way is you can say, well, look, I have all of my integers from fn to fn plus 1. For each integer, I have a collection of gaps. I put all those gaps in a giant bin, and I ask how many of these gaps are length 1, how many length 2, how many length 3, and so on. Turns out that's not so bad. The harder question is for each m, I look at its distribution of gaps and say, is the distribution of gaps of this m similar to the distribution of gaps of this m? And if so, are they all similar to basically the same thing? Turns out both questions can be solved. The second one is significantly harder and requires a lot of advanced probability machinery. It involves your Fourier transforms, uh, generalizations of the moment generating function. Lots of good stuff goes into that. And the difficulty is, for instance, I could give you the number fn plus fn halves. That's a perfectly good number in the interval, and it only has two terms. Well, we said we were supposed to have about 0.276 n terms. This has far fewer terms. There's going to be a couple of numbers that have very extreme distributions for their number of summits. Most, however, will be close to the middle. And again, there's going to be a central limit tech theorem lurking in the background. So for those of you who are interested, I'm happy to go over the technical details of something like this. One of the big issues, and one of the reasons I wanted to present this, is to talk about how do you display data. So here is a histogram of how many times I have a gap of length 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. And the theorem we have is that the gap measures converge to a geometric decay. So the probability you have a gap of length 2 is 1 over phi squared, probability of a gap of length 3 is 1 over phi cubed, and so on. Again, not so surprising the golden mean is coming into play. When you look at this, does it look like geometric decay with ratio golden mean? Eh, you know, kind of. So what I did is I plotted over here the ratio between adjacent bins. This is the ratio of the first divided by the second, the second divided by the third, third divided by the fourth. And then I compared it to the solid line, which is the golden mean. And you can see that's a pretty good fit. Now, one of the things that I find very interesting right now is this kind of your, your Y-shaped behavior coming out of the extremes. Is there some kind of alternating pattern going on? And that's something I would be very interested in exploring later as to do you have these tendencies to overshoot and undershoot? Now we're looking at numbers, and unfortunately it's cut off a little bit, with about 208 digits. Later today I'll be reporting on simulations with 200,000 digits, you know, looking at extremely large numbers. Because everything is just an array of integers, we can actually work with such large numbers without too much difficulty. Uh, the following is a beautiful result, and this is a great way to you know, cheat on taxes and whatnot. It goes back to some of the other things we've talked about. The distribution of the longest gap. We talked a little bit about this in some sense with roulette, in looking at strings of you know, reds and blacks. So you know, imagine you're flipping a fair coin, and you're not reading Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, because this is a very bad example for someone. <laughs> you're flipping a legitimately fair coin. If you flip it a hundred times, what's the longest run of heads that you expect to see? What's the longest run of tails? What's the longest run of heads or tails? You know, these questions are all similar. If you can answer one, you can basically answer all of them. If anybody's interested, there's a really nice paper uh, by Schilling, not the baseball one, that describes the <laughs> mathematics behind this. If you think about it, it's a very easy to relate this to what we're talking about. In the Zeckendorf decompositions, I want to know how long do I go between, between seeing summons. Well, if you think of every head as a summoned, and every tail as a not summoned, as a number that's not chosen, that's just asking for the distribution of the longest one of tails. And so these are all the same problems. The difference is with the Zeckendorf, maybe there's some kind of dependencies between summons. If I have this summoned, maybe I can't have the next one. Well, I definitely can't, because I'm not allowed to have adjacent. Does that make me less likely to have one nearby? Uh, we've seen only once before a double exponential in this class. Can anybody remember where we've seen a double exponential? 
moment generating function of a Poisson. <coughs> a moment generating function of Poisson. So this is one of the few cases I know of a double exponential. And so what it says is that the probability the longest gap of m is at most some number f of n is approximately this. So the probability that this is less than equal to f of n, what's the name for this <coughs> expression here? This is the cumulative this is the cumulative distribution function. Now, what the hell does a double exponential mean? I, let's imagine f n is about log about log n times log of b. So I think there's a small typo here. Um, yeah, I think this should be a multiplication over here, or this should be a multiplication. One of the divisions has to be multiplication. Right. For simplicity, let's just drop the log of b. If f n equals the log of n, this perfectly balances. And I have e to the 0. e to the 0 is 1. And I have e to the minus 1, so I have 1 over e. So I have a probability of about 37%. Let's say f n log phi is a little bit larger than log n. Let's say that this is, you know, log n plus log 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 n. Right? Log 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 n is very small relative to log n. If this is just a little bit larger, the main terms cancel, and I get e to the negative log, log, log n. e to the negative log, log, log n is log, log n. So now I have e to the negative log, log n. That's 1 over log n. As n gets very large, that's essentially 0. So what this is telling me is that if I'm just a hair less than the mean, the probability is essentially 0. And in fact, you can go the other way. If this was uh, log, if this was you know, the correct mean, instead of uh, plus, if it was now minus log, log, log n, I would get a probability of essentially 1. The probability is extremely tightly concentrated about the mean value. This is very different than what you get when you toss a coin and you just ask, how many heads do I have? If I flip a fair coin n times, I expect about n halves heads. What do I expect my fluctuations to look like? So I flip a fair coin n times, I expect about n halves heads. What do I expect for the scale of the fluctuations? As a function of n, how big? What should the standard deviation be? 1 over phi to k. I mean, I'm no, no, I'm just talking about flipping a fair coin now. I flip a fair coin n times, I expect n over 2 heads. Approximately as a function of n, what do I expect the fluctuations about the mean to be? What do I expect the standard deviation to be? About what do I expect? about square root of n. So if I flip a million coins, I'm expecting fluctuations of size about a thousand. It turns out if you look at the longest gap between heads, it grows like log of n, and the fluctuations, the sin deviation is bounded by 4, no matter what n is. It is extremely tightly concentrated. It's very surprising that it's so tightly concentrated. The variance does not grow with n in a significant way. The same behavior happens here. All right, so this is a great way to review one of my favorite themes, the cookie problem. I will post the clip from Sesame Street when Cookie Monster meets the count. It's a very entertaining, uh, ir irresistible force, but it's immovable object. Okay? The number of ways of dividing C cookies among P people is C plus P minus 1 choose P minus 1. So this was one of the combinatorial, you know, aha moments we had. And so, you know, the proof is if the Cookie Monster eats P minus 1 cookies, that divides it into P sets, and this is how many ways there are to eat uh, P minus 1 cookies from this many cookies. So I have to have a little bit of fun. 8 cookies, 5 people. Cookie Monster arrives. Cookie Monster gobbles up 4 cookies. I always like to have 2 cookies next to each other. This goes to the first person. Second person is screwed. Third person gets 2. Fourth person gets 3. Fifth person gets 1. There's a 1 to 1 correspondence between the number of ways Cookie Monster can eat these cookies and the number of ways we can divide things. You know, this is the proof by story. What I want to do now is I want to show you why I care about this. You know, why did I spend time in the beginning of the semester? It's not just because it's a great way to look at common control problems. I can now give you the most complicated proof of Zeckendorf's theorem known to me and woman child, what you walk. Okay? This is the most complicated proof of Zeckendorf's theorem that I know. But it turns out that this proof is much better than the standard proof if you care about more than Zeckendorf's theorem. If you only care about Zeckendorf's theorem, this is a stupid proof. 
But if you want to do more, it's a much better proof than anything that has been done. And it gives us a better way of attacking the problem. So let's just rephrase what we're doing. We've really counted the number of solutions to this Diophantine equation in the integers. And if I want to restrict all the x's to be at least 2, if I have some notion of fairness, which may or may not be the case for the housing uh, lottery at Williams, you know, I can easily add constraints like that without too much trouble. I should be careful because I'm actually on that committee. <laughs> okay, so let's let p and k be the number of integers in my interval whose second of decomposition has exactly k summons. So what I'm doing is I'm taking my set and I'm doing what to it? I'm taking my set of integers in this interval and what am I doing to my set? Partitioning. I'm partitioning it. So we haven't talked about partitions in a while. Okay? Why do we care so much about partitions? When you partition things, frequently the different sets have properties that you can then exploit for things. I want to partition my set so that each set that I'm working with has something nice that I can use. Each set of numbers is going to have exactly k summons. One of the summons has to be fn. If it's not fn, it's going to be too small. So let's take some number in the interval. I have no idea why I switched to n. The largest summon has to be f sub n. And I have k summons total, so I have something like this. This one could be as small as 1, can't be smaller. This one has to be at least how much more than I want. Has to be at least how much more than I want. 2, because I can't have adjacent things. So when I look at the gaps between summons, i1, i2 is greater than i1, ik minus 1, ik, and the difference between adjacent summons has to be at least 2, and you know, I don't really worry about i1. So I can recast this as a cookie problem. So don't worry about following all the details of the algebra. If you stare at it for somewhere between 1 and 3 minutes, it will come. I'm going to let d1 be i1 minus 1, dj is ij minus ij minus 1 minus 2. I'm basically taking all my indices and I'm throwing away the bumps I know they have to have. And if I sum all the d's, I basically have to get up to n modulo the fact that I've thrown away these 2's and these 1's. So you know, if I sum all the gaps, I've got to get all the way up to fn. But when I put these gaps, I've thrown away the fact that the gap has to be at least 2, and the first one has to be at least 1, so I have to put this back in. So the sums of the d's is n minus 2k plus 1. Oh, wait a minute, that's the cookie problem. Right? I have k cookies. I'm sorry, I have n minus 2k plus 1 cookies, I have k people. So how many ways can I do this? That's the cookie problem. It turns out it's n minus k choose k minus 1. So what I've now done is, I've now done, in some sense, Zeckendorf's theorem. What I've shown is, you give me a number that has k summons, and I look at all the numbers that have k summons, this is how many there are. You have to show that if you have k summons, and you have another thing that have k summons, they're not the same. If you have two things with two different number of summons, they're not the same. Each decomposition is unique. That's not so bad. All we have to do now to prove Zeckendorf's theorem is prove that if you sum this over all possible values of k, you get the total number of numbers. So you now need to prove some combinatorial formula about sums of binomial coefficients with k's in the numerator and the denominator. It turns out this can be done. It beautifully comes up to fn minus 1. So this is an extremely convoluted proof of Zeckendorf. Okay? But the reason it's so useful is now I have an explicit formula for how many numbers have exactly k summons. <coughs> if I'm trying to prove something such as, oh, I don't know, the fluctuation in the number of summons, this is exactly what I want to have at my disposal. <coughs> okay. So what I want to do is I want to prove Gaussian behavior first. So as n goes to infinity, the distribution of the number of summons becomes Gaussian. And the proof is to use Stirling's formula to approximate the binomial coefficients we had a moment ago. How many of you have seen History of the World Part 1? <sighs> There's a beautiful scene, it's good to be the king. Sometimes it's good to be the professor, where you can have your students do the calculations. And so, you know, this is the calculation of using Stirling's formula to experiment thing out and approximate and keep track of the error terms. <laughs> and you know, they kept running. Somewhere around here, this is where they, you know, the pitchforks appeared. You kept going, kept going, and then you finally get this the little box over here, and you get the Gaussian in the limit. Okay? So you can just plug away and use Stirling's formula, and you've got the result. It's extremely unenlightening, and you have no idea really why it's true. Okay? But you can get to the Gaussian behavior from this. 
The problem is this doesn't really work too well if you generalize to other occurrences other than the Fibonacci's. It's very rare to be able to write down in closed form how many summons do you have. Typically we have to use generating functions. So this was the warm-up proof to just you know, make us convinced that the result was correct, but then we had to completely scrap this for the generating functions. And so I want to go through a little bit of the generating functions. So more generally, instead of considering the Fibonacci numbers, I'm going to just consider some kind of recurrence relation. Right now, the only recurrences I can consider, for the most part, is all the C's have to be non-negative integers. Just this past summer, we figured out a way to handle some very special cases where some of the C's are negative. And they cause some very strange complications. And so, it turns out you can create a new notion of legality. You know, the Zeckendorf, you can't have two things that are adjacent. That condition generalizes. I don't want to go through the whole details of how it generalizes. I will just say it generalizes as to don't be an idiot, okay? If I have a bunch of numbers in a row, if I have C1 of a number followed by C2 of the next followed by CL of the next, well, I could just use this recurrence relation to replace that with the next term. So when you look at your decomposition, if you could ever use your recurrence relation to reduce the number of summons by combining a bunch of things, do it. All right? That's roughly what a legal decomposition is. So it turns out all of our theorems hold. Zekendorf's theorem is still true, Lekkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerkerk
When we simplify, we can solve for g of x, and we get g of x is x over 1 minus x minus x squared. We now do a partial fraction expansion. We factor the denominator, and now we expand the denominator by using the geometric series formula, and we get Binet's formula. Okay, so how does this help us in terms of proving Gaussian behavior? So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate all the moments, and we're going to show the moments converge to the moments of a normal. And so this is another way to review a great concept from early in the semester. So I have, let's say, the probability of x equals a half, probability of x equals 2 is a fourth, x equals 3 is 1 eighth. This is a geometric random variable. And I want to calculate its mean. So I want to calculate the sum of 1 times a half, 2 times a fourth, 3 times an eighth. And we do this by differentiating identities. And so if we differentiate the identities, we now get the following expression, and we know ways because we can use geometric series formulas to get expressions for this. So this leads to what's called the method of moments. If you can calculate the moments of your distribution, you should be able to prove convergence in Gaussian behavior and stuff like that. And so the moments of the standard normal, they have a really nice combinatorial meaning. It's 2m minus 1 double factorial. It's the number of ways to take 2m people and put them in groups of 2. Your order doesn't matter, but it does matter who's in your group. All right, so let me just give you a sense of how you would get to this point. So for the Fibonacci's, so P and K is going to be how many numbers we have in this interval that have exactly K summons. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the numbers in the interval n plus 1, fn plus 2, that have k plus 1 summons. So I have to have fn plus 1, and then the next term is ft. And so t can't be n, but it could be n minus 1. <coughs> so if t is n minus 1, oh, well, then I'm just decomposing the number that's now in the interval fn, fn plus 1, with exactly k summons. If t is n minus 2, I'm in the interval fn minus uh, 1 fn with k minus 1 sum, with k summons again. And so I get this really nice recursive formula. Now the difference between this recurrence and the recurrence for the Fibonacci's is the Fibonacci's was just depth 2. This one actually goes all the way down and the depth of this depends on n and is growing. This is significantly harder to solve. But there is a beautiful trick that allows you to solve this in one line. There's also one other difficulty between this recurrence and the recurrence for the Fibonacci's. So one is that the depth can, is growing. What's the other? There's one other difference between this and the Fibonacci's. P sub n is missing. Uh, okay, so that's just one term is missing, yes. We have two indices. Fibonacci numbers only had one index. This has two indices. So we would need a theory of bivariate generating functions. Fortunately, such a theory exists. Okay? <laughs> and so here's the trick. You know, we just calculated how many ways there were to choose a number in this interval with k plus 1 summons. Calculate how many ways there were to choose a number in the interval fn, fn plus 1 with k plus 1 summons. And now what should I do? I'm sorry? Subtract. Subtract! Right, this is how we prove the geometric series formula when we weren't using basketball, right? We took the expansion, we took a related expansion, we subtracted, a lot of things canceled, and then we were left with a really good expression. So again, one of the goals of today's lectures, I want to highlight all the different techniques we've been doing and how these can be used. Okay, when we subtract, oh hey, this isn't so bad now. It's still got two indices, but it's got a finite depth. And we actually get rid of your issue of now the terms are at least adjacent in n. So it turns out there's a generating function in two variables, and you can write it down in closed form expression. It also has a partial fraction expansion, and you can do all of this. Uh, you can calculate all the different moments using di differentiating identities, and you actually prove that everything goes to a Gaussian. In the more general case, instead of the simple Fibonacci number like this, you have a little bit longer recurrence relation like this, and the general uh, <laughs> formula becomes a little bit more involved with x's and y's. But it can be done. Uh, Continue. You can't. You know, again, they, they did, did it. You, did your students ever talk to you after this? Yeah, they, yes, they did. They, of course, also needed letters of recommendation. But, uh, they got into some of the top graduate programs in America. You know, this work appeared in you know, one of the top journals. Uh, they worked very hard. They got good results. And there's more good results that can be gotten. Some of the students who were in this um, REU had only taken probability with me. 
So you have the same background as they do. Okay, I want to briefly talk a little bit about the longest gap. So we've got maybe three minutes left. So I will just jump very quickly to... <coughs> okay, it's not letting me jump quickly. Um, unfortunately, I do have the ability to hit... Okay, yeah. Okay. So, I'm just going to briefly show you how things go for the longest gap. G N K F is going to be the number of integers in my interval with k non-zero summons and all gaps are less than f. And it turns out that this is a coefficient of a generating function. I'm not going to go through all the details. I'm going to just let you sit back and enjoy the math as it's flowing. You get partial fraction decompositions. I get generating functions. I end up getting uh, a nice formula for things. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to show you some data. And I want to end today's class by showing you some data. So here is a plot. Uh, the blue is the observed longest gap. The purple is the predictor as a function of n. Okay? And so I chose a bunch of points. And do you think we did a good job predicting things, yes or no? It looks yeah. like it's off by a constant. Now, is this a good way to be viewing data? No. It would not be a Professor Miller class if we didn't do what? Take, log. sure, Take log. logs. Take logs. Oh, insult the Yankees. Either one is acceptable. Okay? Take logs. Now, it turns out for this one, I expect the longest gap to be about log of n if I'm at the nth Fibonacci number. So in some sense, this axis, this is the longest gap observed. This is the index. This I've already taken a logarithm of. So really, I only need to take a logarithm of the x-axis. And now I'm going to... Uh, uh, re re that's right, it resizes my computer from here. So what worked in my office doesn't quite work here. Oh, it's perfectly planned. So now, here's a plot of the longest gap as a function of my index. Good fit or bad fit? Again, looks to be off. So how should I look at the data? Is this a good way to look at the data? In biology, they say once you give birth, if you don't have any care of your children, it doesn't really matter what you do. It's over. It's done. There will be class tomorrow, but in some sense, the SES form is about to be handed out. Whatever is done tomorrow doesn't really count for the course. This is my last moment. This is my final thing to end with. How should we look at the data? Look at the, um, or graph, I don't know, is that graph the derivative, or look at the slope as it's going to see whether they're matching? Not quite the slope. So I have my observed and I have my predicted. What should I look at? Residual. Residual. Look at the difference between the observed and the predicted. Now, the, the difficulty in the proofs, you know, I know we went through it very, very quickly with all the generating functions. I'm not sure if my students and I have made a mistake in terms of looking at the longest gap is at most f to the longest gap is less than f. What's the difference between those two? One. One. So, do you want to see the residuals? Here is what you get when you get the residuals. So I'm trying to see, are we off by one? <laughs> and what is the value, what does the residuals look like it's fluctuating about? A half. A half. You know, the most useless possible data we could get. Right? We're looking at things with 200,000 digits. Are we off by one? Well, the answer we're getting is right in between. So unfortunately, it's very frustrating right now. And so we're trying to go through, but there's a lot of stuff that can be generalized along these lines. And so in terms of you know, things to do, if anybody's interested, there are lots of great projects for this for small 2014. I hope to have some of you applying. If you do have questions about this or other research, I'm happy to talk to you about that. We will do more things on Friday's class. I was thinking of talking about another small project that reviews 